Assuming debate, the Honourable Member for Foothills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, thank my colleague from Regina Capel for sharing his uh, time with me. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say uh, it was a long day yesterday. As I watched the announcement from the uh, Minister of Environment, uh, that's a good start, thank you, uh, the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Natural Resources, I was eager to see some sort of glimmer of hope that this Liberal government has now understood uh, what the, the significance of the energy industry to Canada's economy and that they understand the crisis that's going on in the energy industry right now, especially in Alberta. I must admit, when they announced the first of their five principles, I was somewhat optimistic. The first principle was that the, the projects that were now in the queue would not have to go back to square one. I thought this was a good start. Uh, obviously, uh, my optimism did not last very long. In fact, with the, each additional layer of bureaucracy, delay tactics and vague guidelines, I came to realize that announcement, as many, as, the, as many people in the oil sector did as well, that this announcement meant we will likely never get another pipeline built in Canada. I would like to take a moment today to explain to Canadians exactly what happened in that announcement yesterday. The Liberal government has told Canadian investors, in fact all Canadians, that they would rather support foreign oil producers over Canadian businesses and Alberta employers. They believe the environmental record of Nigeria, Russia, Saudi Arabia is a better option than Canada's world-renowned regulatory regime. They would rather listen to vocal foreign-funded lobby groups than Canadian innovators and economists. They would rather support economies in Venezuela, Iran and Sudan over Canadian jobs and Canadian families. Completing these crucial pieces of infrastructure would transport Canadian oil extracted under world-class Canadian standards, create Canadian jobs and establish a secure source of market for a Canadian product and raise revenue to fund Canadian social programs and Canadian infrastructure projects. Instead, the option the Liberal government has selected is supporting having Eastern Canada import 630,000 barrels of foreign oil a day from places like Nigeria, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, places, places that are not exactly world-renowned for their, their environmental stewardship or their human rights records. This, in essence, is exactly what happened yesterday. And Mr. Speaker, this is not rhetoric. This is what I am hearing from Albertans every single day. Not just people in the energy industry, but people across the province. These are Albertans who today feel abandoned by this Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, this decision is absolutely devastating to the Canadian economy, and we will feel it especially deeply in my riding of Foothills, where everyone, everyone, directly or indirectly, relies on a strong energy sector for their livelihood. Whether you are in the energy industry, whether you're Clean Harbors in High River, or the Canadian Oil Sands Construction Company in Okotoks, or you own a hotel in Claire's Home, uh, you're a welder in Pincher Creek, or you own a shop in uh, the Crow's Nest Pass. This news and this lack of leadership and, and lack of uh, a framework is going to be absolutely devastating to Southern Alberta. After the announcement of the delay of Energy East and the Trans Mountain Pipeline extension yesterday, I spent last night speaking to to many stakeholders across Alberta, and the feedback was unanimous. The message this announcement sent to Canada's resource sector is we're closed for business. Instead of, they want to add bureaucracy, red tape, and add polit political influence to try and reach consensus. Adding more layers of regulations, infringing on provincial jurisdictions, and delaying decisions will not reach consensus. What we need here from this Liberal government is leadership. Leadership to do what is best for Canada, and stand up for a strong record as a resource-rich country. Provinces such as Alberta, through the Alberta Energy Regulator, Alberta Environment, already have strong regulatory regimes to measure GHG emissions upstream. In fact, Alberta announced even more stringent climate change framework in November, and now the Liberal government wants to add additional bureaucracy and red tape to that already difficult system. It was under this Conservative government's leadership that we passed the Pipeline Safety Act, which ensured a world-class pipeline safety regime. We also strengthened the National Energy Board, funding to increase annual inspections of oil and gas pipelines by 50% and double the number of comprehensive audits to improve pipeline safety across Canada, which is now among the best in the world, with a 99.99% safety record. That's something the rest of the world will envy. 
Canada's environmental regulatory regime is among the best of the world, especially when you compare it to some of the countries who are going to be exporting their oil into eastern Canada. For example, in 2013, the World Energy Council acknowledged Canada's higher, uh, higher pace of environmental improvement and ranked it higher as a builder of sustainable energy systems compared to other fossil fuel countries, including Norway, Australia, and the United States. Based on energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability, the World Energy Council ranked Canada number nine in the entire world. The low carbon fuel standard stated there are 13 oil fields in California alone, as well as uh, uh, crude oil blends in six other countries that generate a higher upstream green gas emissions than the Canadian uh, bitumen production. Where is the dirtiest oil in North America? Well, it certainly isn't in Canada. In fact, it is just outside Los Angeles, where the oil field generates twice the level of upstream GHGs as the Canadian oil sands. The title of world's dirtiest oil goes to the brass crude from Nigeria, where the upstream GHG emissions are more than four times higher than the Canadian oil sands. But we don't seem to have a problem with importing that into eastern Canada. In a 2014 study by Worley Parsons compared Alberta's environmental standards to nine other comparable jurisdictions around the world. And Canada are ranked amongst all ten when it came to transparency, compliance, and stringency of our, stringency of our environmental record. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government is further putting Canada at a competitive disadvantage compared to other oil-producing countries, including the United States, which is not talking about a federal carbon tax, is not stopping building pipelines, and in fact has doubled their production to 9 million barrels a day over the last five years. Canadians understand energy is a critical part of our economy. It provides jobs and opportunities from coast to coast to coast. It is unfortunate to see this Liberal government trivializing the importance of our natural resource sector, even though it makes up 20% of our nominal GDP, $160 billion a year. The proposed Energy East Pipeline has two distinct elements. The conversion of 3,000 kilometers of existing pipeline, existing natural gas pipeline that will be converted to transport oil. An additional construction of 1,500 kilometers of new pipeline in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec and New Brunswick. This 4,600 kilometer pipeline will carry approximately 1.1 barrel, million barrels of oil per day of crude oil from Alberta and Saskatchewan to refineries in Quebec and New Brunswick. Energy East will basically, it will generate thousands of jobs across the country and will also address what I hear on a regular basis, the, the want and the need in Canada for value added uh, refined bitumen right here at home. This is a huge win-win for Canada. In fact, Energy East will develop more than 14,000 jobs annually during the nine-year construction stage, and 1,300 of those full-time jobs will be in Alberta. Unfortunately, the Liberal government is now causing further uncertainty in an industry already hit hard by low oil prices, as well as an Albertan carbon tax and a new royalty regime, which may be announced tomorrow. The downturn in the energy sector impacts all Canadians, but is hitting Alberta's, Albertans hardest of all, and it is only getting worse. While the Liberal government feels their lack of leadership in the resource sector is refreshing, Alberta's oil and gas sector is hurting. More than $50 billion in investment has already left Alberta, and the wealth transfer from Canada to the United States is about $30 billion a year. Now this week, Stats Canada has announced the initial job losses report for Alberta was incorrect. Instead of 14,000 job losses, they are now saying 1,900, 19,000 Albertans have lost their job last year, the worst since the Liberals introduced the National Energy Program in the 1980s. Alberta's unemployment rate, once the envy of Canada, is expected to exceed 8% in, by the end of 2016. Mr. Speaker, one thing really caught my attention in the announcement yesterday, that they made this announcement for children of our future. I remember growing up in Saskatchewan in an NDP government. My dad asked me, go to Alberta, take advantage of the Alberta advantage, and don't come back, there's nothing for you here. I am very fearful that under this Liberal government's policy, I'm going to have to tell the same thing to my kids, that you're going to have to leave Alberta because there aren't jobs here for you. 